So yes, I do a lot of things for our community, including vice president of OSI and all that. And I somehow managed to do it with apples. Don't know how I do that, but. Um, so yes, hello everyone, Freenode Live. You're going to look at your speaker notes where the very first thing says, start your timer. I always forget this. All right, I've done that now. So um, I am incredibly honored to be the final speaker of Freenote Live. And it's also kind of intimidating because we've seen so many amazing speakers and inspiring talks. I mean, Neil just before us. To having to follow Neil? Are you kidding me? So I'm very honored to do this. Um, I will probably not go the full time. So we can either do some Q&A or you all can just bugger off and go to the pub. That's cool too. But this is me, and for those of you in the audience who know me or who know of me, you will probably not be too surprised that I have opinions. So because of that, it's possible we might go the full time. I don't know. Let's find out. Let's learn together. It's so exciting. Regardless, though, of whether I go the full time or not, hopefully this presentation will give you something to speak about later in the pub. Now, I'm going to start nice and easy with some, like, softball, which is an Americanism, I apologize, I am American, um, some softball questions to the audience. Three of them, starting with number one. By a show of hands, who here believes in open source and free software? Okay, and everyone else, I'm guessing, is just posting on their Mastodon. <laughs> so, next question, two out of three. Who here would like to see more free software in the world? Yes, this is the audience participation section of the talk. Awesome, hands down. Big surprise, pretty much everyone, as far as I can see, because I'm going blind up here. Now, third question, third and final question. Who here knows what free and open source software is? So, Hands down, it might seem like a weird question to ask considering the audience here. Um, and hopefully, y'all playing at home, along at home on the live stream were raising your hands too. Uh, but it is a weird question to ask in this audience, but I'm finding out more and more as time goes along that it is something I need to ask because it turns out it's knowledge that we need to revisit and we need to refresh. Because as Kyle pointed out earlier, there are a lot of people in our midst who haven't been doing this for as long as I have. I've been using free and open source software and contributing and participating for like 30 years now. There are people who haven't been doing it as long as he has or Crystal or any of us. They're new people. And they've kind of been learning this as they go along. We who've been here for a long time, we understand what free and open source software is, but others may not they do have a sense of what free and open source software is, but they've gotten that through a sort of telephone game of the definition, and they've learned it from someone who learned it from someone who learned it from someone. And at the other end, you get end up with a message and a mission, which is not quite the same as the way it started at the beginning. So, it is more important than ever that we all start today, and I guess since I am at the end of the conference, at on the same page as far as what free and open source software is and that we revisit this. So guess what? We're going to do a little revision here. Uh, here's a quick refresher course before I get started with the actual content because it's going to inform everything going forward. Keep it over there so I don't dump it all over my MacBook. Number one, what you see behind me in a great big screen, isn't this beautiful? Okay, what you see are huge four freedoms. These are the four freedoms as defined by Richard Stallman and as defended by the Free Software Foundation and anyone who believes in free software. Now, I don't think it's a stretch to assume that everyone in this audience probably knows these. They might not be able to rattle them off at, at pub quiz or something, but you know them. So you all know these, but what I'm learning is that fewer people are familiar with this. What you see here, this is the open source definition. It's maintained by us at the Open Source Initiative, and it is accepted around the world as the single canonical definition of open source. Yes, there is one, believe it or not. Now, the open source definition is built upon the four freedoms. They are right there at the very beginning of the open source definition. 
but it's also built upon the Debian free software guidelines. So thank you, Debian community, for really blazing that path for us. We're very grateful to you. Now the OSD, the open source definition, it details what is required of any software that calls itself open source. This defines what the term open source even means. You have those four freedoms at the top there. Your free distribution, you have to get source code, you can create derived works. You also have to maintain the integrity of somebody's creation. So you can't take their work, strip their credits out of it, and present it as your own. That's not open source. You can't discriminate against people and how they may use the free and open source software project, the open source project. You can't discriminate on how they use it or what they do with it. So an open source project cannot limit someone from using that project in a way that the maintainers may believe is incorrect according to their ethics and their belief. An open source project must allow the freedom for people to make money off of the project. All of these are freedoms that we are ensuring that everyone will be able to use. As the software is distributed, you absolutely have to have a license in there. Otherwise, nobody knows the responsibilities they have under that license. And they can easily transgress and do something that's counted to the license if they don't have it there. But that license itself, it can't be specific to a project, can't be specific to a product, it can't be specific or otherwise restrict software. So you can't, for instance, release a piece of software, call it open source, and then say it's not allowed to be run on Windows. That's not freedom. That's not giving people the freedom to use the software as they need. And that license also must be technology neutral. So if there's something you don't believe in, for perhaps, say, missile guidance systems, that's a technology that free software and open source software must be allowed to run on. And it's very difficult, something we have to deal with in free and open source software, how our projects will be used. But that's part of freedom, is allowing people to do these sorts of things. Software that does not provide for every single one of these 10 items, none of them are optional. But software that doesn't provide for that cannot be called, literally by definition, it violates the definition, so it can't be called open source. And this is something that we have a big problem with in our world right now, is that people provide the source code, so therefore it's open, right? No, because you don't get insured these freedoms that come with open source software. Now, the way you can ensure that the software that you're using, that the software you're releasing is actually open source software, is by making sure it has an OSI, an open source initiative approved license. Now, why is that an assurance? Because people come to us and they give us a license and they say, hey, can you review this? We're like, sure, this is what we do, we got this. So we take your license, we take the open source definition and we compare them. Does your license provide all 10 of those items? Is it a match for the open source definition? If so, then we approve it and you know that any software that uses that license provides these things. If they don't fit, we don't approve it. And you can still use that license, but there is no guarantee that it will provide these things. So the only true guarantee is to use the OSI approved license, and then you know you and all of your users get everything on this list. So that's pretty great, right? Everyone in this room probably agrees that the four freedoms and the open source definition, these are great, these are good things, yay. And as good things, they deserve to be widely adopted, widely used by all sorts of people. All of us, we feel this way. And we, all of us, in this room and watching on the live stream, we share a mission to increase free and open source adoption across this world. All of us. And it's great. But despite that, as an overall movement, we keep tolerating and accepting things that work against that mission of spreading free and open source software. It's not doing us any favors. You've heard a lot of the speakers in the past two days talk about this. Now I'm just sort of here to wrap them all up. For instance, it is unfortunately typical for projects to be horrible to their contributors. 
The things I'm showing you on the screen, these are just a few of the stories people have shared with me about their experiences trying to participate in a variety of free and open source software projects. Now, I, I really do wish I could say that these stories are outliers, they are exceptions to the rule, but the majority of the stories, almost all of them I have received, not just recently as I was gathering information, but over my 30 years, right, they are like this. The sad truth is that each and every one of you in this room, watching the live stream, you all either have heard of or yourself unfortunately experienced stories just like this. But that's not all. Because as badly as many projects have been known to treat contributors, there are even more projects which intentionally or not, frankly, it doesn't matter, but they are downright hostile to the people who are trying just to use the project, not even contribute. It's safe to say that the user experience of many pieces of free and open source software is not optimized for the users, but rather for the developers, for the people who are writing the code, rather than the people using the software. This developer-centric perspective, it often leads to this weird, disparate mishmash of user interface paradigms and you know, reinvented wheels and an abundance of user confusion. So people are turned away from even using the software. This by free and open source software developers for free and open source software developers mindset, it limits the number of people who can reasonably use our software. And what makes sense to a developer may not make sense to others and, heck, sometimes it doesn't even make sense to other developers. As well, we have a tendency to bias only for people using free software solutions. By limiting our support only to free software, only to systems running free software, we have similarly limited the number of people who might use and eventually even support free software. All of these stories I've been showing you, each and every one of them, point to an area where we can do a better job, many areas where we can do better jobs bringing people into the free and open source software fold and sharing free and open source software with more people. One of the things that has really stuck with me from the talks I've heard in the past few days was John Sullivan yesterday. And he was talking about, sorry John to call you out there, but it's a good thing. He talked about how people keep saying, yay, free software has won. Yay, open source has won. We've got corporate adoption, woo, go team. But he pointed out that that's not actually the mission of free software. Free software isn't winning until everyone is able to experience the freedoms that come with it. And we have fallen very, very short on that. And a lot of that is our fault. And a lot of you out there are sitting there thinking, not me, I do a great job. My project is awesome, right? You're thinking that, and I'm just gonna get it right out in front of it and go, yes, I know that. There are FOSS projects and people who are amazing, who are doing a really good job of this. They're bringing in new contributors and they're being kind and helpful and mentoring and they're writing excellent documentation and they're studying usability like Neil said for GNOME. They're actually doing usability testing. Lots are starting to look at accessibility testing as well to capture that 25% of humanity that has some sort of disability, 25%. We ignore them. However, enough projects have been that bad. And it's been going on for so long that it's given the entire movement a bad reputation that we all, each of us, can work to improve. Now I know this because most of my work is outside of the movement. As a freelancer, I help companies understand, use, contribute to, and release free and open source software in a way that's both good for their bottom line, because they have fiscal responsibility, but also for the community. And they look at us and they don't understand. And they want to understand, but they have a bad reputation associated with us. And my job is to help correct that. And I do it one company at a time. And it's good and it's helping. But even if you're really good at this, I'm sorry, you're being painted with the same bad reputation brush. 
So we can do this. All of us can help to improve the reputation of free and open source software. I mean, look, improve is right there in the four freedoms. Improve. We have the freedom to improve. So we shouldn't just apply it to our software, but also to our movement itself. These freedoms up here and these benefits that I've listed among the others of the open source definition in the four freedoms, they're as important and relevant today as ever, if potentially not more so. Fighting for the freedoms and resisting in the way that John mentioned yesterday. These are so worth sharing. They are so worth spreading. But by turning a blind eye to discrimination, to unkindness, to a poor usability in our projects, and in the projects that we ourselves use in tolerating this, we are what we tolerate. By tolerating this, we, each one of us, we are all guilty, myself included. We're guilty of holding free and open source software back from meeting its full potential. But every single person in this room, we are all positioned to do something about it. And we all have the knowledge and we all have the passion to do something about it. And if each one of us just lifts a little bit, we can all lift free and open source software up to its full potential. We can do this. Doesn't take much. Baby steps are still steps. Every small positive thing you do adds up in a massive way. The very first thing we should do, though, is we need to start recognizing that a ton of free and open source software is carrying so much baggage. And that baggage is known as privilege. I listen to people constantly talk about this, and all I can do is go, you're not looking at other people's perspectives. You're holding free software back by not admitting and recognizing the privilege of free and open source software. It is a privilege to have the free time to learn how to program or the resources to afford to go to university or hacker school to learn how to program. Many people don't have that time or those resources, but without programming knowledge, it's completely impossible to learn how to use a lot of free and open source software, even the stuff that's consumer facing, that's supposed to be user friendly. It's not. The first time something goes wrong, someone is in the deep end and they're going to drown. It's a privilege to learn how to use free and open source software, to have that time. It's also a privilege, it's a massive privilege that we in free and open source software, we really need to address right now. It is a privilege to be able to make the choice to use only free software solutions. It's a huge privilege to say that because most people in the world are not in a position where they can dictate what software they use to make their living. They don't have that freedom. They have to keep food on their table. They have to keep a roof over their heads. In America, they have to pay for health care for crying out loud. And if whatever job they have requires they use proprietary solutions, well, by gum, if they're not going to use proprietary solutions, they're not going to stamp their little princess foot and say, no, this isn't free software. No, they're going to use proprietary solutions, and they're going to feed their family. The freedom to choose FOSS is a privilege. Please recognize not everyone has it. So we do need to stop and step back and look at the perspective of all those people who aren't using FOSS. Why not? Why aren't they using it? Acknowledge the privilege we have to make the choice to use FOSS and how, figure out how can we start sharing that privilege with others? How can we make it easier for them? How do we, re we reduce that privilege barrier? Because FOSS, as John said, it's never going to win until all people can experience the freedoms that it can give you. So where do we start? It's actually really easy. There are four things, four, four places I think we can apply our actions, our care, our passion. Obviously, there are tons of things that we could do, so many, to increase the understanding and adoption of free software outside of our little bubble where it's currently staying. There's lots of things we can do, you know, but right now we're in a bubble where we know what it is, we understand, but others don't. How do we spread that out? 
If you don't know where to start, start with these. And yes, I'm going to go into these a bit more detail because just four nouns, who cares, right? Nouns, yay. So, applicability, usability, inclusivity, humility. These are great, but before I go into telling you what they mean, I need to make sure, again, we all keep this in mind. This is the goal of everything we should do in free and open source software. This is it. We have to increase boss usage and adoption if we want people to experience those freedoms, if we actually want boss to win. Yeah, we could do things like focus purely on contributions um, or say government or whatever, right? But where I think we can make the biggest splash is in your common folks, the people who bag your laundries, the people who you know, are making your cupcakes, the people, these are the people who don't understand and can actually get a lot of benefit out of open source software, right? How do we bring FOSS to the broader population? Well, it is in those four words. And I'm going to start with the one at the top because that's the way I roll, with applicability. Now, how do we make FOSS more applicable? to more people outside of our little bubble. We all know how we can apply FOSS to our own lives. We do it all the time. But how do we do it for others? Right now, many, but again, no, not all, but many FOSS projects are built, again, by FOSS developers for FOSS developers. And that's gotten us really far to this point. But it's time to branch out. So what do non-developers, what do non-technical people need in their software? What do they need? If we target those less technical users, then people will like us. It'll be great. So target them. Try and figure out what they need. These people may sympathize with the philosophies of free and open source software. They may actually sympathize with that, but it, they don't care. And why don't they care? Because they have problems they need to solve, and the FOSS isn't solving the problems that they need to solve. So we should take the time to learn how to communicate, as Kyle said earlier in his keynote. Learn how to communicate with people not like yourself. Listen to them. Don't speak to them. Listen to them. Listen to what problems they're trying to solve, and then build solutions to solve those. This, this people, is how you win hearts and minds not with the philosophies and the mission of free software and the four freedoms. Most people don't care about that. They care about their problems. So if you solve their problems, then you have made an inroad. And now, now they start to see how free software can help them. Now you can start talking to them about the philosophies of free software because they'll, it's real for them and they'll understand. The next of our four little words is usability. As you are looking to solve those problems, make sure you do it in a way that makes sense to those less technical users. And believe me, you will also be helping the technical users as well. Uh, Neil, I'm, I saw him go up there, so I'm going to keep assuming Neil's over there. Um, so he was talking about how GNOME is uh, actually designed for usability. They have UX people, UI people. This isn't just for big desktops. This is for all projects. One of the great things that we're starting to see in free and open source software, and as Neil alluded to in hit the answer for his final question, one of his final questions, was that uh, they're starting to see different kinds of contributors. Now, this warms the cockles of my heart because it's something that I try to do, and I wrote a whole book to try to get new types of contributors to free and open source software. Um, but it's something that you can do. So actively recruit UI, UX people. They're out there. And they probably want to help, but you got to ask them. Because to this point, FOSS has looked entirely by devs for devs, where the word devs does not include UI UX. It doesn't include InfoSec. It doesn't include accessibility. It doesn't include a lot, technical writers. But we're starting to get those people on board. But you got to go ask them. And then they'll realize that, oh, I am welcome. They do need my help. But if you can't find them, because there's not a lot of these people and they're probably quite busy, especially after all y'all go out and start recruiting them, at least consider this. 
Consider this principle in all of your interfaces. Command line, API, graphical user, I don't care. It's an interface. Don't surprise people. Oh my gosh, the number of times I'll pull up a piece of software and go, where, how do, uh, <laughs> this isn't like the proprietary thing everybody knows already. Because you're trying to be original. We don't want to be like the proprietary shit, do we? No, we are FOSS. I'm sorry, but other people know the proprietary stuff. They're familiar with it. Use those UI paradigms, and people are more likely to use your software. Kind of interesting, isn't it? People will use the stuff that they know. Another piece of usability that we are so bad at is documentation. And everybody knows this. We keep beating the documentation drum. Never seems to sink in, but I know writing is hard. Trust me, writing is hard, and writing well is very difficult. But writing user-facing documentation, simply about how to solve those problems with your software. Writing that, it allows the users to do a lot more things on their own. And they don't have to come to you and ask questions. And that reduces your bus factor, or increases your bus factor, because you're not the one constantly being pinged with silly questions, silly questions of your difficult to use software. Um, so write the user-facing documentation. People can self-service. And you know what's great about non-technical users self-servicing in free software? It's that they feel accomplished. I did a thing. I solved a problem. And I didn't have to ask anyone. I didn't have to go to my technical cousin to get this solved. I did it on my own. I am badass. And if they feel badass, they feel well disposed towards your project, they're not only more likely to continue using it, but they're going to tell all their friends and their family. And they're going to continue feeling badass because they can help other people. But you have to allow them to self-service. So documentation allows you to do that. Word number three, inclusivity. Now, there are billions of software using individuals on this planet. Billions of them, tons. We want to welcome them to free software. Well, if we're going to welcome them into free software, we have to welcome them into free software. And this means understanding and accepting that others outside of our little bubble they have different experiences, different needs, different skills. Means it means uh, considering those experiences, those needs, those skills, and putting them before our own if we want to bring these people into the fold. For instance, please stop bashing Windows users. Platform shaming is terrible. Windows is far and away, like light years away from any other user interface or any other operating system as far as adoption. It's huge. Don't argue with that. It's a fact, Jack. So just accept it and support its users. Support people who are using other platforms. If you can build your FOSS project so that they work on Windows and that they're easy to use and they solve the problem, you know what you have just done? You have infiltrated and you have opened the doors to a potential flood of new free software users. But if you only limit yourself to things that run on free platforms, you will shut those people out and they will never experience the freedoms of free software. I do a ton of work with people who want to be new contributors to FOSS. And it probably, unfortunately, is not a newsflash to anyone in this room that we have a terrible reputation. Even projects that are usable, again, I've mentioned this earlier, that one big brush we're all being painted with. Usable, helpful projects get painted with the big brush of a terrible reputation. New contributors are absolutely petrified that they're going to show up, be raked across the coals, and treated like trash. 
This kind of ties into a question that came up in Bradley's excellent. God, I wish he were here. I, I loved his keynote yesterday about, you know, why are people choosing Slack instead of IRC? And afterward, in the Q&A section, people were proposing, you know, reasons. Here's why people are using this, and maybe they're using it because of that, and maybe, you know, emoji. I love emoji. Sorry, this is a solved problem. James and the amazing people at IRC Cloud have made a really great client that is just as good as Slack. So it's not a technical thing. None of the people after Bradley's talk mentioned the real reason why people aren't going to IRC. And again, this isn't anic data, this is actual data that I'm hearing from real live people. I speak with those new contributors. I speak with people who have been around for a long time who have left IRC. They all tell me, each and every one, that the reason they left IRC is not because it's old and crufty. It's not it. It's not because it's hard to use, because these are really intelligent people. They can figure this out. That it's difficult to use isn't a problem because if they can see that it's serving a purpose and they're okay with the fact that it might be a little arcane. No, the reason they left IRC and that they don't want to show up at all is that IRC is overflowing with trolls and assholes. Every single one of them says the exact same thing. I'm hearing the same thing from random people whom I hadn't met before. There are some channels that even I won't participate in because the community of those channels has allowed trolls and assholes and assholery to flourish. And I just won't go because life is short. And once I spend my time, it's never coming back and I'm not spending it on those people. And that's what I'm hearing from people is they want to participate in IRC, but they won't. That is why IRC is losing to Slack. It's not technical, it's social. For good or ill, Slack is a gated community. Whereas from the perspective of new contributors, IRC is Mordor. And they don't want to be anywhere near it. So it's not about the technology or the licensing or the freedoms. Again, it all comes back to the experience and the bad experience people are having and the worst experience they want to avoid. So COCs, codes of conduct, they can help with that, but only if we learn how to enforce them. Having a piece of paper doesn't mean anything. Okay, I know you probably don't print them out, but work with me here. Okay, so enacting codes of conduct is fine, enforcing them better. In order to enforce them though, we do have to do some of what Kyle was mentioning earlier, which is learning how to communicate with people. I loved the example he used where you will argue about like top posting and inline or you will quote to him chapter and verse of the Klingon rites of passage. Those are things you learned. Communication is another thing that we are perfectly capable of learning. As he said, the human protocol, you can learn that as well. It is hard, not as hard as actually having those difficult conversations. I have them all the time. And they're not fun, but they are always necessary. They're always important to have. But you can learn this. And as you are learning these things, and as you're starting to enforce your codes of conduct, recognize that ignorance is far more common than malice. It's more likely that somebody didn't know there was a line there before they stepped across it. It was just ignorance. They didn't know they were doing something wrong. So as we enforce our codes of conduct, doing them with empathy, right, and coaching people rather than chastising them, and that will make everything a much more pleasant experience. But also, it is vital that we know where to draw the line, and that means instituting a no asshole policy. People who refuse to learn how to play nicely with others after being coached multiple times, they must leave, full stop. If they can't behave, they make it a toxic environment for everyone and one ap bad apple really does spoil the lot. So they're free to leave and no, your project isn't going to suffer even if it's a core maintainer. Yes, your project might slow down a little bit, but that's okay because overall, it becomes a healthier place and you're more likely to start attracting more contributors. And by doing this, each time you improve your community in this way, you also 
take just a little piece out of that bad reputation of all of free and open source software. So you're helping all of us, and that's great. Now the fourth little word here is humility. We must remember that even though to this point it's been FOSS devs, by FOSS devs, for FOSS devs, we can't do that anymore if we want to expand and if we want more people to love and use and understand free and open source software and experience those freedoms. So FOSS isn't just about you. FOSS isn't just about me. FOSS is about us. So consider the needs of other people and the impact that you and your actions and your software has on other people and the experiences that other people have when they use your free and open source software projects, when they interact with you and your community. But most importantly, please stop expecting people who aren't capital T, capital B, true believers. Stop expecting them to understand and use free and open source software. People who don't know, people who don't understand, and whose needs are not currently being met, they will not join the movement. They're just not going to do it. Why would they? Because it's the right thing to do? That doesn't solve their problems. By not meeting people where they are, recognizing where they are and meeting them there, we are closing the door to most of the software using population of the world. We want to grow the use and adoption of FOSS. And I think everyone in this room probably wants to do that, right? If we want to grow that, we must go to these people. Discover what their problems are and their needs and their reactions and their problems. Just figure that out. And then rather than waiting for them to come to you to find your solution, go to them and offer them a solution. Hi, I see you're having a hard time getting Wi-Fi in your area. We have created this thing that's free wi free software. Let's set it up. That's a problem real people have. How can we solve it? Is there a solution already? Great, find those people. Offer them a solution rather than expecting them to find you. So by focusing on these four little words, and through understanding and having empathy with others and a user-focused approach, FOSS can reach and influence those billions of people. All of us together, we can reach billions of people. And it all starts here in this room. We can do this. Baby steps, and we can do this. These slides are already available here at Internet Archive. I want to thank you all so much for being here, for building and maintaining and supporting free and open source software and everything it means to the world. Thank you Freenode Live for having me and especially huge thanks to every Freenode volunteer who has been working not only this weekend and for this event, but every day of every month of every year to keep the Freenode service running. Thank you, you're all amazing people. Officially, I have seven minutes left if anyone has any questions, but not comments concealed as questions. Um, I will repeat the question so we don't have to make poor Nathan run up and down the steps some more, although he's been doing a brilliant job. So actually, applause for Nathan for running his ass off. <laughs> Thank you, mate. I know, I just embarrassed you. Um, so are there any questions? Yes. Uh, so the question is rel about codes of conduct. There is a lot of pushback about having a written and defined code of conduct about what is and what is not good behavior rather than the standard, and I'll be totally honest about my opinions here, totally fucking bullshit, be excellent to each other code of conduct. Um, yeah, the thing is excellent means different things to different people. And if you are very explicit about no unwanted physical attention, 
No unwanted, even mimicked physical attention. No uh, this, no that. You know, whatever your community says is not what we do here. If you're not explicit about that, then someone's going to rules lawyer you. And you're going to have all sorts of bad actors. So if you don't want bad actors, be very clear. This is the line. Do not cross it. But you can't do that if you don't draw the line because otherwise no one knows where it is. It's really wibbly wobbly. More questions? I'm like totally going blind here, so I don't think we have any. Hey, yeah, you get to go to the pub five minutes early. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.